Welcome to Truth in Christ, everyone. I am so glad that you could join me for another great message. Today, we're going to be looking at the argument that the tribulation is just for the Jews. Now, this is an argument that is used by many pre-tribulation rapture believers. It is a very common argument that you will hear from many of them, in which they use this argument that because the tribulation is just for the Jews, that means the church cannot be here. And this is a way for them to dismiss or disregard any verse that is contradicting the doctrine. They can say, well, the tribulation is just for the Jews, so therefore your interpretation of this particular passage is incorrect, even though this particular passage is an absolute contradiction or an absolute refutation of the pre-tribulation rapture doctrine. So this is just a way of dealing with with certain verses that they don't like. Now let's get right into the argument and what they use as proof text. And you're going to find that these arguments are in fact rooted in assumption. Now this is the first of two of their arguments that I'm going to present. This first argument that they use is found in Daniel the ninth chapter, the 27th verse, and I call it the 70th week assumption. And the reason why I call it the 70th week assumption is they are assuming that this verse is somehow proof text that anybody else is being precluded from the tribulation now this particular passage is talking about the beast of revelation confirming a covenant with many for one prophetical week and one prophetical week is seven years so in the middle of that week he is going to cause sacrifice and oblation to cease Again, the reason why I call this the 70th week assumption is they are assuming that this somehow is proof text that anybody else is precluded from the tribulation. It does not say that the tribulation is only for the Jews. So their method of interpretation is rooted in assumption. They are assuming that a particular verse will preclude others from the tribulation, even though common sense would tell a person that this is just one verse speaking of one element of a much broader narrative with a lot of nuance and a lot of things going on they have reduced it all to a verse that speaks of one element of the tribulation now are there certain elements of the tribulation that may affect the jews more than other people sure The beast conquering Jerusalem, I assume, would be a bigger problem for the Jews than anybody else. But that does not mean that the entirety of the tribulation is only for the Jews. That is only one element. So yeah, there are going to be certain elements of the tribulation that affect certain groups of people more than others. Certain elements of the tribulation will be more regional. Certain elements of the tribulation may be more global. But common sense would tell you that Daniel, the ninth chapter, and the 27th verse does not preclude anybody else from the tribulation because it is only speaking of one element of a much broader narrative. Now, let's look at the second assumption. This second assumption that I'm referring to, which is their other argument, is found in Jeremiah, the 30th chapter, the 7th verse, and it's what I call the Jacob's Trouble assumption. The problem with their interpretation of this verse is the same problem that you find with the way that they interpret Daniel the ninth chapter the 27th verse in which they are assuming that this part that says it is even the time of Jacob's trouble somehow precludes others from the tribulation and this is somehow proof text that the tribulation is only for the Jews now again that is all rooted in assumption however there's also a greater problem and if you haven't read jeremiah the 30th chapter i recommend that you do so because this verse is not actually talking about the tribulation it is actually talking about the dispersion of the jews out of the land of israel it is talking about when god drove jacob out of the land of israel the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom had been completely exiled and then this particular chapter also promises their return that is the context of jeremiah the 30th chapter so when it is talking about it is even the time of jacob's trouble it was talking about the dispersion i even thought about doing a video dedicated just to that particular argument but all i would be doing to refute that argument is reading jeremiah the 30th chapter that's all it would take to refute that argument 
and then point out that even if that was a tribulation verse, their argument is still rooted in assumption that this somehow means that other people are precluded from the tribulation because it would only be one verse talking about one particular element of the tribulation that is a part of a much broader narrative but that's how weak this argument is that the tribulation is only for the jews it's all rooted in assumption whatever they try to present in proof text is only assumption there's not a verse that actually says that the entirety of the tribulation is for the jews or that the tribulation itself is for the jews and that others are precluded or especially the church somehow is precluded from the tribulation you don't find a verse like that but if a person is familiar with the bible at all they won't be convinced that these particular passages are proof text or evidence that the church is precluded from the tribulation or that others are precluded from the tribulation that is that somehow it is an exclusively jewish problem and why are we not convinced well, let's look at the book of Revelation just for a minute. So the tribulation is not just for Israel and the Jews, because in Revelation, the seventh chapter, the ninth through the 14th verse, there is a great multitude of people which no man can number. And look at this. They are of all nations. So it's not just Israel and kindreds and peoples and tongues. So all races, all ethnicities, all languages, all nations there are people that are arrayed in white robes who are identified as the people who came out of the great tribulation and they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb so let me say that again it's a great multitude of people of all nations kindreds people and tongues so all nations races all of it and these are people who came through the great tribulation and as sad as it is there are going to be people who believe that the tribulation is just for the Jews will try to argue that the people who came through the great tribulation are the Jews of Israel. Now, again, I'm not saying this is universally believed, but it is a very common argument. And I have actually, with my own two little ears, I have heard and with my own two little eyes, I have seen people try to argue that the people who who come through the tribulation or the tribulation saints are the Jews. Yet when we look at scripture, it is very clear that there are people who come through the great tribulation and they're of all nations, not just the nation of Israel, and they are of all races and languages. So it's not just the Jews. So it's kind of hard to argue that the tribulation saints as the people who believe in pre-tribulation and rapture like to call the people who come through the tribulation. They, they like to try and identify them as a separate group from the church. They're not a part of the body. They're a completely separate group. According to some pre-trib dispensational believers, uh, the tribulation saints have to earn their salvation. And I call that an outright heresy. Nobody earns their salvation. It is through grace alone. You will not earn your salvation through works. And they'll try to say it's a different dispensation. Even Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. To teach that people have to earn their salvation, that it is not a free gift from God, that is a heresy. And you know, I don't throw that word around a lot. Even when I really disagree with somebody, but to teach work salvation and that is true work salvation that is in fact a heresy but i digress but now let's go back to the book of revelation in the 13th chapter verses 5 through 8 now it talks about the beast speaking blasphemies and power was given unto him to continue 40 and two months that means he reigns for three and a half years as he blasphemes against god uh, against god's name uh, his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven so this guy is speaking against everybody but then it says it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them now this is a direct quote from daniel the seventh chapter in which it talks about this antichrist this beast making war with the saints and prevailing against them it says he will wear them out and again, you're going to hear that common argument. Well, it says the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. The Greek word there for hell is 
Hades, which means death. Death will not prevail against the church because we will be resurrected. Again, this is the importance of context. If we cite things, we need to cite it in context. So he's overcoming the saints. Now, this is this persecution of the saints is happening within that 42 month time frame. And then it says he has power. Now, look at this. Again, it says over kindreds, tongues, and nations. So he is persecuting the saints. Now, their argument would be. Well, these are Jews, but now we have just read in Revelation, the seventh chapter, that these individuals are actually from every nation, kindreds, people, and tongues. And we see that the beast has power over the kindreds, tongues, and nations. So his nation is a superpower that is exercising authority over the nations so he is not going to be an exclusively jewish problem he's not going to be an exclusively israel problem he's going to be a problem for people from various nations and races and languages so really we've already made the case that this is not an exclusively jewish problem but let's just continue it says all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life. Now, this is not saying that every individual besides the saints who come through the tribulation is going to worship the beast. It is saying that the people who dwell on the earth and worship the beast, their names are not written in the book of life. And it's important to remember that particular point because this does explain how the world is going to be repopulated during the millennium. Now, I did a video on that, and I will leave a link in the description box down below if you are interested in that video. But getting back to my original point, when we read this, it doesn't say it's an exclusively Jewish problem or a problem that is exclusive for Israel only. It is a problem for nations of people. But he is a problem because of the religious fanaticism that he will inspire. He is going to be a problem for the world because. People throughout the world, throughout nations of different races and different languages, these people will worship the beast. Again, not exclusively Israel problem now, is it? Now, when we look at these arguments rooted in assumption, they fall apart quite easily under the light of Scripture. They built an entire argument around assumption saying that the tribulation is for the Jews only. Yet, Scripture is very clear that the saints who come through the tribulation are of various races, various nations. These are the saints of God. They came through the tribulation. This is the church because they are going to make the argument, well, the term church isn't used after Revelation, the third chapter. Well, neither is the term Jew. Arguments from silence are weak. But if we actually look at the Codex Sinaiticus and we look at the last verse of the book of Revelation, the church is actually identified as the saints. Again, I digress, and I did a video on it, and I will leave the link in the description box down below. But these saints do come from various nations and various races, absolutely refuting the idea that everybody but the nation of Israel is precluded from the tribulation, or that the church is precluded from the tribulation. But also, their argument does not follow what I call Paul's tribulation paradigm. Now, in what I call Paul's tribulation paradigm, he is talking to the church of Thessalonica. He is relating their current situation to the end times and the second coming of Christ. And in this paradigm, he does lay out what tribulation means for the church and what God does through the tribulation. I did a full video on this, and I will leave a link in the description box down below. Now, Paul, when he's talking to the church of Thessalonica, and again, this is a church. I want to make that abundantly clear. He's not talking to the nation of Israel. He's not talking exclusively to the Jews. He is talking to the church of Thessalonica, and he relates their tribulation to the end time. He says the church endures persecution and tribulation, but he said they endured it with patience and faith. Then we go down into the sixth verse. And Paul tells us that God will recompense tribulation on those who trouble the church. In other words, God is going to reward tribulation or repays tribulation on those who put his church through the tribulation of persecution. And then it tells us that the church 
rests when Christ returns with his angels. So the persecution of the church and God's response to that persecution is the tribulation. This is the paradigm that Paul lays out. And this paradigm is completely ignored by their argument of assumption that somehow the tribulation is only for the Jews. Paul is very clear that tribulation and persecution was not only around in their time, but he's also making it very clear that this is going to continue until Christ returns. And in that seventh verse, Paul says to you, he says you, he's talking to the church of Thessalonica. We got to remember who the audience is. He says to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Now, the trouble that the church is resting from is the tribulation. Another way of translating that is to say, those of you who are in tribulation rest with us, or you could actually say, those of you who are tribulated rest with us. But he makes it very clear that it is only when the Lord returns with his angels. And this return will include eternal destruction from the presence of of the Lord. So it's talking about the condemnation to the lake of fire. So this is the second coming of Christ, and the church only rests from that trouble, only rests from that tribulation at the second coming of Christ when he begins to punish people with everlasting destruction. So this is the end of the tribulation, but it is very clear in this paradigm that he includes the church. The church is not excluded from this. So Again, it cannot be an exclusively Jewish problem or exclusively for the nation of Israel. And it can't be for a separate group from the church known as the Tribulation Saints. Paul is very clear on what the Tribulation is. The Tribulation is the persecution of the church and God's response to that Tribulation. But now we have to ask, why would they hold on to such a weak argument if it's so easily refuted? Well, it's because it benefits them in interpreting certain passages. And I'll give you an example out of Daniel. Now, the passage that I am talking about here is found in Daniel, the 12th chapter. And I recommend reading Daniel, the 11th chapter, along with this. It will provide greater context. Daniel, the 11th chapter, in it you will find uh, the rise, the rule, the expansion of the kingdom, and the end of the beast of Revelation, which adds greater context to what's being said here in Daniel 12. It says, and at that time, talking about the events in Daniel, the 11th chapter regarding the beast of Revelation, it says, at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was, since there was a nation even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, everyone that shall be found written in the book, and many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. This passage presents them with some difficulties because it is telling us that the resurrection of the dead doesn't happen before the tribulation. So what they do is they say, well, this is for the Jews. This is for the nation of Israel. I can dismiss this. Look, it says, Michael stands up, the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people. And they'll say, well, that is the nation of Israel, and therefore the tribulation is only for the nation of Israel or for the Jews. Now, Again, I admit there are certain elements of the tribulation that will affect the nation of Israel more than others. The conquest of Jerusalem by the beast of Revelation, I believe, would be a problem that is more concerning for the nation of Israel than others. It is more of an immediate concern for them because it is their land that is being conquered. But that does not preclude others from the tribulation, nor does that mean that the church is absent from the tribulation. But now they're going to look at this and they're going to see the part where it says, the children of thy people and there shall be a time of trouble. To put things into context, this is talking about the tribulation. When it says there shall be a time of trouble and the Greek Septuagint, which is a Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, the word trouble is translated as thalipsis, which means tribulation. It is a time of tribulation. Thalipsis is a word that is used for the tribulation in the New Testament. And now they would like to tie that back to 
Jacob's trouble. But again, we already explored the context of that. It has nothing to do with eschatology, even if you was to look at Jeremiah, the 30th chapter, as a typological prophecy, still would not preclude others from the tribulation. But when we look at the Greek Septuagint, it does not call it Jacob's Thalipsis or Jacob's tribulation. But who are God's people that will be delivered? It says, thy people shall be delivered. Everyone that shall be found written in the book. What's the book? The book of life. Remember, the people in the earth that worship the beast, their names are not found written in the book of life. Remember, it is only God's saints whose names will be written in the book of life. It's the names of the saved. So you can't worship the beast and be saved. But now look at the timing of the tribulation. When are the people delivered? Well, not before the time of trouble. Look at that. It says, at that time, thy people shall be delivered. Everyone that shall be found written in the book. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. So the resurrection of the dead does not happen before the tribulation. The resurrection happens after the tribulation, at the end of the tribulation, post-tribulation. And we can harmonize that with Revelation, the 20th chapter. When we look at the third through the fifth verse, it talks about the devil being thrown in the pit. He's going to be sealed for a thousand years. But look at this. It says, he should deceive the nations no more. Again, not an exclusively Israel problem, is it? He's deceiving the nations. And for my friends who believe in a more symbolic interpretation of the millennium, who believe that we are currently in the millennium, I would like to ask you to think about this one thing. Are the nations currently being deceived? Because during the millennium, Satan is not going to deceive the nations. Are there nations where Christians are being persecuted? Are there nations that are deceived? Are you sure we're currently in the millennium? Again, that's, that's a genuine question I want you to ask yourself if you don't believe in the millennium as far as a literal interpretation where the millennium comes after the second coming as per the book of Revelation and Zechariah the 14th chapter. But again, I digress. But it is clear even here that the deception is not just for the nation of Israel. Uh, the deception is for the nations. But then, what does John see? But thrones, and those who sat upon them, judgment was given to them. And he said that he saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Again, the resurrection of the dead is happening post-tribulation here, and they're reigning with Christ. Remember, Revelation, the 19th chapter, talks about the second coming of Christ. And the marriage supper of the Lamb, unfortunately for people who believe in pre-tribulation rapture doctrine, is not what they think it is. But Revelation, the 19th chapter, is talking about the second coming of Christ. So, Revelation, the 20th chapter, is continuing with some details about the second coming of Christ and the things that are going to happen. And the resurrection of the dead happens at the second coming. And then there is a thousand-year reign. But in the fifth verse, it says, But the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection that could not be clearer especially when we take daniel the 12th chapter the first through second verse and we harmonize that with revelation the 20th chapter the third through fifth verse it is clear that the resurrection happens at the end of the tribulation so this particular type of interpretation gives them an easy way out they feel as if they don't have to do their due diligence. Daniel, the 12th chapter, the first to second verse, according to them, that is for the nation of Israel, that is for the Jews. Why? Because it contradicted my doctrine. Because Daniel, the ninth chapter, the 27th verse, told me so, even though it really didn't. It did not preclude the church from the tribulation. It's just a small part of a much larger narrative. But the doctrine is rooted in assumption. It agrees with their bias. So therefore, that is what they want to believe, even though 
under the light of scripture, that argument falls apart quite easily. So therefore, anything that disagrees with their doctrine, anything that disagrees with the narrative that they don't believe in, even though we do have verses that say that the gathering of the elect happens after the tribulation. Matthew, the 24th chapter, tells us immediately after the tribulation at the coming of the Son of Man, that he will send out his angels and they will gather together his elect. Well, now they can say, well, that is the Jews. That is the nation of Israel, even though it says it's his elect. That's the church. But because that disagrees with their doctrine, they're going to take that and put that over here in the nation of Israel spot. That is their problem. That is their baby. This is immediately after the tribulation because they're reading things through the lens of their indoctrination and through their bias. And now they're given a way of just dismissing anything that says the exact opposite of what they believe. Second Thessalonians, second chapter, the first through third verse tells us about the second coming of Christ and our, the church, our gathering together unto him will not happen until there is a falling away, there is an apostasy first, and the man of sin is revealed. Meaning there cannot be a rapture before the tribulation. And so all the other doctrines regarding the timing of the rapture can actually incorporate those passages into their doctrine. But pre-tribulation rapture cannot. And as I said before, the cheese stands alone on this. And then that leads pre-trib teachers who are trying to provide answers to their congregation, to the people who follow them. That leads them to trying to redefine what apostasy is, trying to say the apostasy is actually a rapture, trying to say that our gathering to him at his coming, well, that's just something else completely different. Pre-trib teachers are all over the place just trying to explain away those three verses because it's worded in such a way that they can't just throw it off onto the Jews, that they can't just fall, throw it off on the tribulation saints. The thing is with those easy way outs, Sometimes you run into a tough one that's not so easy to explain away. But in conclusion, there's no reason to believe that Daniel, the ninth chapter, the 27th verse, would preclude the church from the tribulation. In fact, there are no verses that preclude the church from the tribulation. But as we've seen in Scripture, the saints who washed their garments and made them white in the blood of the Lamb these saints who come through the tribulation are of all races and nations. I hope you've enjoyed this video, found it informative and edifying. And as I always say, subscribe to us on YouTube. If you're watching this on YouTube, subscribe, turn on that notification bell, set it to all. Uh, the same thing with Rumble, follow us there, turn on that notification bell, so that way you can stay up to date every time I upload a video. Like, share, comment. Every interaction with this video is going to help this video and this channel out in the algorithms. And for other ways to support this channel, you can check out the link in the description box down below, or you can give us a super thanks as a way of supporting this channel. But as always, this content is always absolutely free to you. God bless you, and I hope you have a wonderful day.